Okay, good afternoon everybody. I'm Anna Barlow, an adult services librarian here at the Troy Public Library. And we're so happy to see all of you on Zoom for today's program, which is generously funded by the friends of the Troy Public Library who are now back in business. Their lobby shop and weekend book sales are in progress and they are accepting donations. So today we're headed to England for Digging in the Shadow of the Shard, Urban Archaeology in London. The city of London is a modern thriving metropolis, a far cry from the barren deserts and deserted jungles people picture archaeologists working in. Yet the UK's capital city contains over 6,000 years of history beneath its streets and a large number of archaeological digs. From stone tools to 17th century hospitals and unexploded World War II bombs, London offers many unexpected windows into the past. Today's talk will offer a digger's eye view of the city as well as a look at archaeological practice. So our host joining us live from England is Ellen Green, a current PhD researcher at the University of Reading, where she's studying the transition from the Iron Age to the Roman period in England. Before returning to academia, she worked as a field archaeologist for five years in London and has dug on sites from every period of the city's history. So I'm um, excited for this uh, fascinating presentation. And so Ellen, we're so thrilled to welcome you on this side of the pond. And um, with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. That was a lovely introduction. I appreciate it. Right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am going to be talking about uh, the archaeology of London. Uh, so this, when I first put this presentation together and picked this picture, I tried to count how many of the sites that I've worked on um, that I could see in here. And at some point I gave up. So this is quite a good view of central London. You've got the Shard here. London Bridge train station here, the actual London Bridge here, the walkie talkie here and the gherkin here and St. Paul's over here. And just to give you an idea, when I talk about urban archeology, span I do mean in the center of the city. Um, it's people are often very surprised <laughs> when I tell them that. But let's start with what is archeology span because a lot of people have an idea of what archeology span is but can't really go into any specifics. So archaeology, if you look it up in the dictionary, will tell you it is the study of the past using material culture. So looking at stuff. So if you want to think about how it's different from history, history is looking at things people have written down, texts, and archaeology is pots and pans and the things people have behind. So I like to think of it sort of as history is going through your neighbor's mail, and archaeology is going through their trash. Both will tell you about your neighbor, but they'll tell you different things. Um, and I find that history and archaeology work best when we work together. Um, we do sometimes get inscriptions like this lovely inscription here, which is the uh, first mention, earliest mention we have of the name London um, from first century AD. But a lot of the time archeologists are putting things together from things. But archeology span is such a magpie subject. We borrow from everybody. So I am what's known as a bioarcheologist. I look at human and animal remains. So a lot of what I'm doing for my PhD, I'm using the latest forensic literature and I do a lot of biology and zoology as well. Chemistry is really important. Um, there's a person in my department who looks at Roman metalwork and can tell you exactly where the metal came from and whether it's been recycled and what mine it came from, just from the chemical components and trace elements in it, which is pretty amazing. Uh, you can tell what people's diets were by looking at isotopes and bones and teeth and where they grew up. we steal a ton from geology. So the basic unit of archeology span is something called stratigraphy, which is basically layers. Um, if you look at this picture, you can see every single one of those tags is a different layer. Yeah, we borrowed that concept. Um, you know, you have to know about sociology, how societies work and anthropology, how people tend to work and think and act. 
And there's also a whole field of archaeology called geophysics, which is dedicated to looking at what's beneath the ground without ever digging. So this is a magnetometry picture of a Roman building. You can just see the squares here. So that's all done with ground penetrating radar and things. Absolutely amazing. They found whole cities in the Amazon just using um, LIDAR, which is a form of radar using lasers. So archaeology in the public consciousness is generally connected to Indiana Jones or Tomb Raider. That's not the most accurate depiction of archaeology. Um, the only time I have ever had to worry about Nazis is, uh, as was mentioned in the intro, London has a massive problem with unexploded World War II bombs. So I have worked on sites where we've had to have people um, from the army on site to deal with that if we find any. But that's about the only thing I have in common with Indiana Jones. Mostly real archaeology is less stealing things and more paperwork and a lot more mud. So this picture down here is three of my colleagues discussing what to do about the fact that we, uh, this trench is flooded. At the bottom of this trench is a Roman burial that we need to record. Unfortunately, this was very close to the river and we dug a bit below the water table. So we had to figure out how to drain the trench so that we could record the skeleton without damaging anything, um, which is more the sort of problem that we have to think about. Less traps and more how to not flood the trench. Uh, you can also see from this picture, I think, which is quite instructive in terms of reality versus perceptions, you can just see the machine there. We dug this with a JCB. So sometimes we use trowels and really, really tiny picks if we're doing really delicate work. Most of the time we use a pickaxe and a shovel and shift quite a lot of dirt by hand. And then we do also use big JCBs and diggers to go through, um, especially the top layers, or if we've got a really big buildup of um, natural silting, which is what we had here. So one of the questions I almost always get asked when I tell people I'm an archeologist is, how do you know where to dig? There's kind of two answers to that, depending on what scale you're talking about. So on the big scale of where were our excavations, in England, there is a law called PPG 16. That means if you want to build something, you have to get an archeological survey done. And if it's determined that you are likely going to have archeology span where you want to put your office building or whatever, you need to hire archeologists to excavate the material, record it before you can build. So in a sense, we don't choose where we dig, we dig where we're needed which has the perk of I have worked all over London and I have seen stuff from every period. Once we have a site though, how do we know where to dig um, has a sort of simpler answer, which is dirt is an amazing different number of colors. I did not believe this until I became a field archeologist, but let me tell you, it's astounding how many colors dirt comes in. And so what we do is we take off like a centimeter of soil and the dirt will often be different colors. The reason this is the case is because a lot of what you're looking at in archeology span is where things were, not necessarily where things still are. So this is a post hole. Um, it was part of a structure. Uh, 17th century structure, so not terribly old. And you can just see you've got this really loose soil around it. Then somebody's dug a hole, stuck a post in, which is this darker bit in the middle, which is decayed wood, and then packed the rest of the hole with chalk because this ground was not very stable and it needed something more secure than just the post and the dirt. And we can see that, you know, when we're digging it. And when we dig it out, we dig it out 
in the reverse order that it happened. So we would take out, ideally, the uh, backfill around the post and then the post. The reason we do it that way is because, to go back to that, what I was telling you about stratigraphy, especially in London, <laughs> Things tend to be on top of each other. People have been in London for a very long time. And if you think about how much material when you knock a building down before machines, people didn't tend to remove that. They just put some more dirt over it to make it a flat surface and then built on top of it because that was easier, it was less effort. So, for instance, you know, you've got in orange on this lovely little section, the medieval layer, and then they've just dumped dirt over it and put the cobbles on top of that. So when we're digging, we have to try and pick it apart in the right order so that we can understand how things happened. So for instance, again, if you look at this, this wall, the medieval wall must have been built after this medieval pit because it's cut into the pit. So the pit had to exist for them to put the wall there. But the collapse must have happened after the wall was built. So you'd take out the collapse and then the wall and then the floor, which is also going over the pit and then the pit and then the soil. And then you'd get down to the Saxon stuff. So it's all about working out how these things interact. And because they've happened at different times, they're often different colors, different textures, you can sometimes feel where the edges of things are. So once we've determined where we're digging, what are we looking at is a really important question and how old is it? So radiocarbon dating is very, very nice, but it is also very, very expensive and only works if you have organic remains, so bones or charcoal. And it's destructive and people tend not to like you doing destructive testing on human bone for obvious reasons. So generally most archaeology is not dated using radiocarbon. Mostly we use pottery because pottery is amazing. Pottery is virtually indestructible. You can take a mug, you can break it, you'll get lots of little shards. Those shards though, there is a limit to how much those can break down and they're not going to be destroyed by water. It's amazing the sort of soil erosion and stuff they can put up with. Pottery is really, really durable as a material. And so basically any pottery post-dating the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, which is sort of before they've quite figured out how to fire it properly, is really very survivable. And styles change. The same way that if you saw a film with a flip phone in it, you'd know it was probably set in the 90s. We can look at pottery and we can determine both from the technology used to make it. We know that, for instance, the potter's wheel was introduced in Britain in the late Iron Age. And also the style, you know, medieval pottery tends to be this beautiful green glaze. Roman pottery <laughs> looks really different. Tudor and Stuart pottery has often got these gorgeous patterns on it, you know? It's very recognizable. And to go back to the stratigraphy, if we have a ditch and above it we have a layer and in the layer there's Roman pottery, we know the ditch must be older than that layer with the Roman pottery. It helps us work out the sequence. The other really cool thing for dating, some people will tell you coins are good. Coins can give you very specific dates, but the problem with coins is people like coins and they keep them. They don't just throw them away, but they do throw away tobacco pipes. So tobacco is first introduced in England in the 16th century and you get these really tiny little clay tobacco pipes. Um, they're handmade, they're quite cute. And as tobacco gets cheaper, the pipes get bigger. And as manufacturing uh, practices change, the pipes get more decorative. And at some point in the sort of 
18th century, they start actually giving the pipes away for free when you buy tobacco. So these are basically ancient cigarette butts. People didn't care about them. You'd smoke one lot of tobacco with it and then you'd snap the stem. The stems are actually about this long and you'd just chuck them. But the bulbs are really distinctive. So we can sometimes get a 30 year period just from which clay pipes we have, which just always blows me away. Also, um, another thing that's really cool about the clay pipes is they often have maker's marks um, on the bottom, stamps on the spit. And that means we have the initials of who made it. And there are some registries that we still have where we can look up who made these pipes, which I think is astounding. One really important thing to keep in mind though, when you're thinking about how archeology span actually sort of functions and what it's like in the field, the items you see in museums have been through a lot of conservation work. There is quite a lot of effort and skill that goes into making them look that good. So to give you an example, this is probably the nicest thing I've ever found. This is a silver Roman ring from Moorgate, um, which is in central London. Um, it's inscribed with the letters M-E-R, which we think is um, a dedication to the god Mercury. It's about second century AD. When I pulled it out of the ground, I didn't even realize it was metal. I thought it was some kind of stone. Um, I knew it was a ring because I could see from the shape, but I had no idea it was inscribed. I had no idea it was silver. It wasn't until the company photographer actually sent me the picture of it cleaned up that I realized just what it was. Iron is really bad for that. So when you see swords in museums, they never come out of the ground looking that nice. The only thing that does come out of the ground looking as nice as you will probably see it in the museum is gold. Gold does not corrode in any way, shape or form. Um, but it is also quite rare to find. So now I've sort of talked you through archeological basics. Let's talk about the city of London, shall we? Uh, I agree with Samuel Johnson. London is an amazing place. And when I talk about London in this talk, I am primarily talking about Greater London, which is this map here. Um, but quite a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is central London. So to give you an idea, this is the bit of London that you could see in that photo at the beginning. Uh, London Bridge is here. You've got the city the square mile here. We've got Westminster over here. This curve of the river is this one right here. Now, all the little green dots on that map are prehistoric find spots. Those are all places we've found stone tools and evidence of people around in the Stone Age. That's Roman London. You can see they've got the road network and you get the walled city and you get a ritual center built up in Suffolk. That is early medieval London. You've got the Anglo-Saxon city of Londonwick popping up over here, uh, but they are still going into the city, but they aren't real fond of living in there. Come back to that. And that's medieval London. So you can see how it grows and comes out and London today is a huge sprawling city. So London is built in an estuary of the River Thames, which is fabulous if you are a hunter gatherer in the Stone Age, because it's basically a swamp with a good source of water and lots of animals. Um, we've actually found mammoth bones in some of the river terraces in London, which I think is pretty cool. But we found a lot of stone tools. So at this point, people aren't building settlements, permanent ones, but they are moving through the area and they're definitely around. And we find tons and tons of really nice flint, worked flint. Flints are still sharp. 
even though it has been a very long time since they went into the ground. You have to be very careful with them. Uh, the first dig I ever worked on professionally, we found some Mesolithic flints and I picked one up and I managed to cut my finger open. Our first dater was not very happy with me. Um, so it's amazing that they can still hold an edge after that amount of time. And uh, working flint is quite difficult. It's very skilled work. And one of the really cool things that you can see with these stone tools is sometimes you can see people learning to make them. So you'll find areas that have, you know, where people have not done it right and thrown them out. And then you can see them getting better. Which again, it's just a really brilliant way to connect people in the past. So this is Mesolithic, Middle Stone Age. It's a really tiny blade, as I say, very sharp. And then in the Neolithic, you get sort of the bigger things. So this is a spearhead here, and this is an ax head here. The ax heads are amazing. Um, they often just feel right in your hand, which is a weird sensation to describe, but the weight of them and the shape of them, they just fit. So the Neolithic, which is the end of the Stone Age, they're just discovering farming and they actually huge deforestation um, across England. So you get quite a lot of these sort of axes. After the Stone Age, you get the Bronze Age. So in the Bronze Age, there's a massive sort of influx of people from continental Europe and they bring sort of new traditions with them. And we get these beautiful, beautiful uh, beakers. In fact, in the Bronze Age, the people that are in the area that London's in are called the beaker people after these. Um, so they, they don't have potter's wheels. These are entirely made by hand. They're very intricately decorated and they're almost always uh, funerary urns. So you find them with cremations and you do find assorted grave goods with them as well. One of the big challenges with the prehistoric period is we don't have any writing. So there's absolutely no written language in England until the Romans invade. Which means that sometimes it's really hard to put together why people were doing certain things. So for instance, this is the Havering Horde. Uh, it's one of the most impressive Bronze Age hordes found in the Southeast of England, it's found in London. North London, and it's mainly socketed axe heads, but you've got some bits of scrap bronze and some spearheads and things in there as well. Now, bronze would have been a very, very valuable commodity at this time. They've only just sort of worked out how to make metal. Um, and to make bronze, you need tin. There's only one source of tin in the British Isles, which is Cornwall, so they must have been trading for it. And this hoard was big. And it was found buried underneath a roundhouse. We don't know why they buried it and left it there. There's sort of three main theories with the Havering Hoard. One is that it's a smith's hoard, that smiths moved around so you would collect your sort of bronze work scraps and then when the smith came around to your village you'd collect them all up and give them to the smith have them melted down and made into new things the other maybe the other main theories is that you know there was a lot of fighting in the prehistoric period that people might have buried it as a way of hiding it if they needed to flee and then they died and they weren't able to retrieve it. And then there's the third option, which is that it is a religious or ritual thing and they're doing it as some sort of votive offering. I personally quite like the third theory because of where it was found. It was under the wall of a roundhouse, directly in line with the door. Retrieving this would not have been possible while the roundhouse was still standing. Equally, putting it in must have happened when they built the roundhouse or before. But given the very exact placement of it, I feel that when they were building the roundhouse is the most likely. Quite a lot of the items were deliberately broken um, in ways that would have required somebody with quite good knowledge of metalwork to have done it. So it's weird, and we'll probably never know.
But if you want weird, the Iron Age puts every other period uh, of English history to shame. I adore the Iron Age. I'm biased. It's part of what my PhD research is on. And yeah, they're doing a lot of weird things. So in the River Thames, we find a lot of really, really nice metalwork from this period. This is the Battersea Shield, which is in the British Museum, and the Waterloo Helmet, also in the British Museum. They're gold. They're beautifully decorated with this sort of swirling abstract style, which is called Latin, um, which is what the Iron Age is sort of known for. Beautiful, beautiful craftsmanship. Um, the Battersea Shield has these inlays. Both found in the river. Don't think they're accidental losses. They're quite big and quite valuable. So the I and we find a lot in the Thames. We find swords, we find coins, we find bones. We think people in the Iron Age are deliberately putting things in the Thames. So we don't really have any big settlements in London in this period. But they are coming into the area and they are depositing things in the river. And we do get some small farming settlements. So this is a grain storage pit from a one such small farming settlement. And when we dug it out, we found a nice surprise at the bottom, which is these two dog skeletons. Again, we don't know why they have put dog skeletons at the bottom of a grain storage pit. Presumably they did so after they stopped using it for grain storage, because you don't want to store your grain over dead decomposing things. Um, but we do know those skeletons were in intentionally placed because they've been posed. There is no way that two dog skeletons would end up in that position naturally. So again, it, it's one of those great mysteries. Why are they doing this? Why are they putting really valuable things in the river? Why are they posing corpses at the bottom of their food storage? Who knows? In 43 AD, the Romans come and conquer and they build what is the first big settlement in London. They build Londinium, which the city walls of Londinium are still standing and you can still see them. They are in the district of London known as the city, um, also sometimes known as the Square Mile. It is not huge. You can do a pretty good circuit of the walls. And it's amazing because they've preserved them in really quite random places sometimes. So you'll go into a parking garage and there'll just be a bit of the Roman wall down there. Which again, I absolutely love. I think it's one of the best things about London. Um, I could give you a whole talk on Roman London, but I'm actually going to focus just on one site that I dug in 2017. Um, uh, it's right by Borough Tube Station um, in Suffolk, if you know London. It's Harper Road Excavations. And the reason I want to talk about this dig is because this dig was really, really significant in terms of our understanding of Roman London. And the press got really excited about it. But what the press got excited about was very different to what we as archaeologists got excited about. And I think it's a really interesting look at different priorities. So what the press got really excited about was this. This is a stone sarcophagus. You can see from the people in there, it's a hefty thing. We had to lift it out using a crane. It's one of only three ever found in London. And it was the first found in 18 years. Unfortunately, it had been robbed some point in the 18th century. So the bones were in disarray and there wasn't really anything in there. We know that this must have been a very wealthy individual. We think it was a woman and child, uh, but it, it's hard to say because most of the baby bones were found outside the coffin, sadly. Um, we do know this area was used as a cemetery, so there's a chance that they didn't actually come out of the coffin. But the press were really excited. It's the one and only time I've been on TV. The BBC came down, they filmed it. It was all very exciting. Uh, Museum of London put on a special display of it and some of the stuff we found inside. So 
when they robbed it, they didn't quite get everything. We did find this at the bottom. This is um, called an integulo. It's about the size of my thumbnail. Um, I wish I had a photo with a scale on to show you. It's tiny and it's very intricately carved with this figure here. The Romans had magnifying lenses um, and they were able to do amazingly detailed work. So there were lots of pretty things that we got out of this. We also found some really nice bracelets. Um, this white stuff here, that's a chalk foundation. So whoever was buried in this sarcophagus, they dug into the chalk foundation to put it in there. It took us over a week to take out this chalk foundation and we used a jackhammer. So I can't imagine the poor Romans doing it with a pick. So that was all very cool. But actually, I think the coolest bit about this site is on this side. So that's a Roman road. Um, you've got your roadside ditches here and what looks like maybe a palisade here. So these are post holes. These dark sort of streaks you can see, those are wagon ruts. We can see wagon ruts from the first century AD on this road, which just blows my mind. Um, and the reason this is really significant is because before we dug here, we didn't think the Roman road went through here. So we have a fairly good map of Roman roads in London, but it's been built up through building site work. So there are holes in it. And sometimes we just draw a point from A to B and assume that it goes straight. Or in this case, we assumed it followed the medieval road. It didn't, it went straight as Roman roads often do. And this is significant because the roads in Roman Britain were very much the lifeblood of the empire. It's where all your trade happened. It's how the military got around. And in terms of just knowing what to expect on a site, roadside cemeteries, like what we had over here, really common. If we had known the road was here, we might have been able to guess that we'd get something like this. Maybe not something as spectacular. That really is a once in a lifetime find. So the fact that we could flesh out the map really helps because now if they develop anything near this site, we'll have a much better idea of what's likely to be around. So after the Romans leave, you get early medieval London, which is characterized by the invasion of lots of Germanic tribes, most notably the uh, Anglos and the Saxons. Anglo-Saxon London is interesting in that they don't live in the ruins of Roman London. So the Romans had this really nice city you know, and the Anglo-Saxons were very happy to rob the stone out and they used quite a lot of the stone to build churches. Because if you've got a really nice already dressed stone, why not use it? But they didn't really live there until the very end of the early medieval period. They built their own city next door called Londonwick. We don't really know why they did that. It's quite interesting. Um... They also built a lot more in wood. And this is when Christianity starts to become a thing in England. This is when the very first church on the site that will become Westminster Abbey, which I'm going to talk about more in a bit, uh, is built. It's also when you start getting this very distinctive knotwork um, that we like to refer to as Celtic knotwork appearing. It's a bit of a misnomer. It's not Celtic. Uh, it's Anglo-Saxon, but it is very, very beautiful and very distinctive. And you start getting the illuminated manuscripts in this period too. In 1066, England is conquered by William the Conqueror and the Normans, and that marks the beginning of what's known as the High Medieval Period. I'm going to, again... <laughs> I could do a whole talk on this, but I'm going to just talk about a little bit of work we did at Westminster Abbey. So Westminster Abbey, if you've ever been to London, is rather a big deal. I highly recommend you visit if you ever go to London. It's where all the kings and queens, most of the kings and queens, have been buried. Um, really, really beautiful. And you can see from this photo here, 
So they, they put in a new visitor center and we did the works ahead of that. We were working inside the abbey, which is pretty amazing. And you can see how the old foundations are just visible. And actually that's on quite a different alignment to the rest of it, which implies, you know, several different phases of building, which we know that they had. So the main thing we excavated there was the kitchens. And we also excavated a cemetery, hence this fellow here. I really like bones. They can tell you a lot about a person. But so can a kitchen. So between the skeletons in the kitchen, we were able to reconstruct quite a lot of what they ate, which was quite cool. So first of all, they had fish bones so big, I didn't even know fish got that big in the kitchens. They were eating a lot of fish, but they were also eating a lot of red meat. Lots of cow bones. And we know that they were probably drinking a lot of wine. We've got a lot of evidence for that. And one of the interesting things is there is a disease called DISH that you can see on skeletons. It fuses the right side of your spine together. Um, it kind of looks like candle wax. It's not very nice. There are genetic components. But most of how you get dish is by eating a really rich diet. Lots of red meat, red wine, fat, really rich foods. It is so prevalent in monastic cemeteries that it's sometimes referred to as the monastic disease. Which, again, the combination of the kitchens and the skeletons, it was just mind-blowing to me that we got this little window into how they were living. Especially because, in my head, I always think of monks as being, you know, very focused on non-earthly things. But clearly, <laughs> these monks were very, very fond of their food. So, Tudor London, very near and dear to my heart. I'm going to talk primarily about theatres. So, there have been three Tudor theatres excavated in the past six years in London, and I've been fortunate enough to work on two of them, um, as well as the fact that the Rose Theatre, which is a Tudor theatre that uh, Kit Marlowe's plays were performed at, is the whole reason we have the laws that protect the archaeology in Britain that we do. So in the 1980s, they found the Rose Theatre when they were building an office block, and there were no laws protecting it. <laughs> it would have been perfectly legal for the building company to run a bulldozer through it and, you know, not tell anyone. And there was a massive public outcry about this. Because people are very proud of their heritage here, especially of, you know, Shakespeare and the sort of theatrical traditions of London. So Tudor theatres are very, very near and dear to my heart for that reason. So this is the Red Lion, which is one of the earliest theatres that has been found in London. Um, it's in Whitechapel in the East End. And we actually had the stage preserved, which I think is, again, absolutely mind-blowing. That's what she's cleaning off here, because the preservation of wood is actually really rare. Wood decays very easily. But the conditions were just right here. And next to it, this is the Boar's Head. Um, the boar's head was really important because we could see the evolution, evolution of how theatres worked in London. So the Red Lion had a permanent company. The boar's head did not. It was an inn. So you've got your sort of pub and hotel back here and then the stage here. And it used to host traveling companies, which is quite interesting. Um, the other really cool thing about the boar's head theatre is that when I first, I, I was one of the very first people to work on the site. When I went out there, it was just this scrap of derelict land that had half a bombed out tube station on it. So in World War II, the Aldwych tube, tube station had been bombed so badly, they decided just to rebuild it somewhere else. So it's a couple minutes down the street now. And they just left the shell there. Um, which was pretty cool. But it was very interesting to see how the theatres evolved from this to things more like the Globe and the Rose that are purpose-built just as theatres rather than as 
theaters slash inns. And then this actually doesn't come from a theater site. This comes from just across from the third theater, which is the curtain. So I can't promise it is theatrical in nature, but I can promise it's Tudor. It's a bird whistle. So you can find modern versions of this, but there would have been a pipe here. You fill it with water, you blow in, and it makes a trilling noise. Um, and in the site report, they thought it might have been used for sound effects for the theater because we were so close. No way to prove it, but an interesting thought. And again, just a weird, funky little artifact. Very cute. So moving swiftly on to the 17th century, I'm just going to talk about two years, 1664, even 1666. These were bad years to be in London. So 1665 marks the outbreak of the Great Plague of London. When you think of plague doctors with the bird beak masks in the leather, this is the period that image comes from. This is when they came up with those outfits. And actually, in terms of early ways of protecting yourself from disease, not a bad plan. It kept you from touching people in the thick leather, kept fleas from biting you. Stuffing herbs in the beak so you didn't smell the bad air did absolutely nothing. But in general, again, because the leather was too thick for the fleas to get through it, quite effective. But the Great Plague was very, very bad. So it's estimated that 15% of London died. Uh, the official death toll that we have from records in the time period is 68,596. This is almost certainly a underestimation because they wouldn't have been counting the poor and the destitute. Now, for a long time, we didn't actually know what the Great Plague of London was. I mean, we knew, obviously, a bunch of people got sick and died, but it wasn't actually until 2015 when there was a dig of a plague pit that we were able to work out exactly what it was. So they, they dug up this plague pit and they were able to isolate the bacteria that caused it, um, the DNA of the bacteria. It's not still viable. You absolutely cannot get plagued from digging up a plague pit, um, important note. But we were able to tell that it was Yersinia pestis, which is the Black Death, which is the same plague that ripped through Europe in the 13th century. Uh, so that was really interesting that we were able to get that information. So, you know, a large amount of London has died of plague. Things cannot possibly get worse, except they can. So in 1666, a fire breaks out in Pudding Lane, which is in the West End. It burns for four days. And it destroys the, again, estimated the homes of 70,000 of the city's 80,000 inhabitants. Really bad. Now, I knew about the Great Fire. It's impossible to work in London without knowing about the Great Fire. But I didn't realize quite how extreme the Great Fire was until I did um, a specific dig outside St. Paul's Cathedral and we hit the Great Fire layer. This very uninspiring looking artifact came out of that. That is pottery that is fused together from heat. Pottery doesn't like to fuse together once it's fired. It has to get very, very hot to do this, and estimates from the sort of material that we find melted uh, indicate that the fire probably got as hot as 2,280 degrees Fahrenheit. It was an impressive fire. But the thing that really drove it home to me was not even necessarily this, although I've never seen anything like this before or after, but it was how deep the layer was. So remember what I was saying about people not removing debris? After the Great Fire, they just sort of raked everything flat and built on top of it. Now, I have dug fire layers before. There was the Boudican Rebellion in 60 AD. In the Roman period, you find that well, London was burned down then. You get a layer of ash, maybe like yay big. The Great Fire layer, when I dug it, was over two meters. Now, two meters in feet is 6.56 feet. That's taller than me. That's significantly taller than me. Um, and it was just ash and 
burnt brick and fused glass and fused pottery. And it just kept going down. So the amount of destruction the Great Fire caused was huge. And so let's fast forward again. Now that we've talked about all of London burning down, it was rebuilt by Christopher, well, lots of people, but Christopher rendered quite a lot of the architecture and it's very pretty. You can still see quite a lot of his work. Um, but the Industrial Revolution. Now, British archeologists can be a bit snobby about the Industrial Revolution. I had a lot of colleagues that felt it wasn't old enough to be proper archeology. span I disagree. I don't think any other period in history has changed the way we live quite as much as the Industrial Revolution. And in terms of the archeology, span one of the reasons that I really love it is because we can see some really human stories. So this is a mill, a water mill in Tottenham, which is again in North London. And this is the same mill, but you can see the different layers. So this is what the mill looked like in the early 19th century. And this is what the mill looked like at the end of the 17th century. They have reused quite a lot of the structure. So ignore this bit in the middle. That's actually from a modern flood channel that's on the other side of this fence. But this round sort of Pac-Man looking thing, that's a furnace in the 17th century. They're using it, it was a paper mill. Um, they used it to heat up gelatin, which was part of the paper making process. In the 19th century though, they've converted it into a machine base. And you can see they've put in this little thing where a gear can go and they've really built it up and you can actually see where they've put something heavy on it. Now we know from looking at the historical records that in this period, they bought a steam engine to make the mill more efficient. And it's really cool that you can see how the changing technology changed the structure and where, how they've rebuilt it. But I like the Industrial Revolution because we get gossip magazines and this mill had a very scandalous history involving blackmail and tax fraud and uh, throwing people into the river and lawsuits. It just got really ugly and it, it reads like a soap opera. It's brilliant. And you can connect it to the archaeological remains. It's great. So I just want to finish up by saying a few words about why archaeology is important. On a big picture, archaeology is important because the past dictates so much of what we do in the present. You only need, need to watch any debate in American politics and count how many times they talk about the Founding Fathers to see how much our history determines what we do. Preston and where we come from is actually really important to the human story. And I think it's really important that we know the truth because it's very easy for people to manipulate their versions of history. And archeology span is, I think, the best way to do that because archeology, span everybody has trash. Um, often with literary texts, especially in earlier periods, it's only the rich and the powerful that get written about, but we can really look at the lives of everybody else through artifacts, which I think is really important. But on a smaller scale, and the reason I think archaeology is important, the reason I care so much about it, is because people have always been people, and there is no better way of seeing that than looking at archaeology. So this is a Roman stylus, um, first century AD. It's basically a pen, and it has this wonderful Latin inscription that basically comes down to, I went to Rome, and all I got you was this pen as a souvenir. Sorry, but I was broke. And I love the fact that somebody in London in the first century AD had this ridiculously tacky souvenir pen. It is like the sort of thing my brother would bring me back when he went on vacation. It's great. And it's, it's those little windows. It's finding fingerprints on pottery or loaded dice or Viking ice skates that just help you remember that no matter where or when, you know, 
people have always been people with dreams and ambitions and doing stupid things. There is graffiti in Pompeii that would not look out of place in a London pub toilet today. And I think it's really important, especially right now with the, there's so much that separates us to remember that. So uh, that's my talk and I will be happy to take any questions. Okay, well, thank you, Ellen, so much. It's obvious that you're so passionate about this topic. And um, it really is fascinating to think that there's all those, those layers beneath London, isn't it? You said, you mentioned earlier that you were eight when you became interested in archeology. span And did you specifically go to England to study archeology? span Were you always at the University of Reading? And um, is that what you started your university studies in? It is what I started my university studies in, and it is why I moved to England. Um, I have not always been at the University of Reading. I did my undergrad and my master's at the University of Durham in the north, but I've always been really interested in Roman Britain. So it made sense for me to come here. So is that the be is that the so being in London and doing a lot of your archaeological work in London is that the best place to do that? Then? Yeah. Yeah. London is an archaeologist's paradise. <laughs> um, the only period of British history, well, not necessarily period or a bit of British history that isn't represented in London is um, the Vikings. Mm -hmm. um, and even then, in some bits of London, you can sometimes find bits and pieces. Um, but mainly it was the Anglo-Saxons in the south and you get the Dane law in the north. But it's... It's amazing, <laughs> the stuff in London, really. So I know that you can um, see a lot of the artifacts in museums, but you mentioned like you could be in a parking garage and see part of uh, like a Roman wall. Um, and I think somebody had, I've heard it before too, like you could, I mean, it's allowable to say, go into say a barber shop and say, oh, take me to your basement because I know you have a piece of like, the Roman road in there. Is there, is there like, can you take a tour to do something like that? There are lots of walking tours of London um, that will show you around, especially in the city. Um, I think the Museum of London runs a few. The Museum of London is, would always be my first stop for looking for anything like that, especially because they've incorporated, again, bits of the Roman wall into the museum mm -hmm. uh, where they've built it. But yeah, I mean, sometimes I find with London, the best way to find things is just wandering. There's a really beautiful 17th century church called St. Dunstan's in the East that was bombed in World War II and just left as a ruin. And I found it when I got lost trying to find the tube one day. And it's beautiful and amazing and just randomly in the middle of the city. <laughs> That's that's incredible. I've got a couple um, comments. Great presentation and slides. Thank you. And another, this is a wonderful presentation. I would listen to Ellen educate us for hours. Thanks so much to the library and to Ellen. So let's see. Okay. Yeah, so I think you've answered everybody's questions. But I think it's I think it's just fascinating, and um, yeah, I'd love to go on sort of like an archaeological tour to to see where all of these different sites are. Um, maybe that's the next thing you can do. <laughs> it, it has been a thought, um, but it is amazing, and you know, again, sometimes uh, the Bloomberg Building, which is a massive office building in central London, has a Roman temple in the basement. You can just go see it; it's free. <laughs> Just wander in and see it. It's amazing. Is there is there like a book that would tell you where to go? Um, I wonder. There almost certainly are. Uh, if you want to know more, I'd recommend London Under is a general good reader um, okay. about the underground systems in London. It's not all about the archaeology. They also talk a lot about the tube and things, but it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Um. But in terms of a walking tour, again, the Museum of London website is probably your best friend. Okay. 
I have somebody asking, ever study any dentist archaeology? I do do dental stuff. Um, in fact, I was in the lab looking at teeth this morning. <laughs> uh, he says many people die from dental problems during the plague. It's very hard to tell how somebody died when you just have their skeleton, but certainly abscesses and things caused a lot of problems. Although interestingly, uh, people in the past, in the far past, had better teeth than you'd expect because sugar doesn't become a common thing sort of really until the 17th century. Mm -hmm. um, before we discovered agriculture, our teeth were great. <laughs> And then you start to get dental problems when we get agriculture because we're eating grains and things. Mm -hmm. And then 17th century sugar gets imported to Europe and it's cheap and accessible. And that's when everybody's teeth really go downhill. <laughs> Maybe we should take, um, I don't know, should we go back to that way? <laughs> Um, I have another question. Um, is there a pattern of travel for the Romans from Italy to London? That is a really, really good question, and I would need to do some research to look at that. We have evidence of people from all over the Roman Empire being in London, though. Um, it's really interesting. We get inscriptions with African and Middle Eastern names as often as we do Italian and British names. Um, so I don't know if there was just one route. I think the main crossing point was probably um, on the Sussex coast is usually where they reckon. Is that the shortest point between, you know, over the channel or? Yeah. Okay. But we don't know exactly that there's a lot of arguments over exactly where the Romans first invaded. <laughs> But there were certainly big Roman settlements um, along the East Coast, and the Romans also conquered France before they conquered Britain. So that was probably the main route. Wow. Right. Are there any other questions? Um, I don't see anything else in the Q&A in the chat, but I think it's just really a fascinating presentation and overview of things I had no idea. I, I think it would be, I just can't imagine finding something like so small and then, you know, finding out that it, it's actually something that was really important or that it really is something, you know, and you had the, the ring. Um, it just looked like, okay, maybe a piece of stone and well, that's not important. And it turns out to be something that is. I, that's just incredible. I was in absolute shock when the photographer sent me that photo. <laughs> I never read a million years when I pulled it out of the ground. Well, it's a good thing you knew to do something with it and give it to somebody to clean it up. I mean, we pick up everything, whether we think it's important or not. It goes in a bag with a label and we get specialists to sort out. Wow. You know, um, we have to document everything, whether or not it's valuable. Mm -hmm. But specialists then look at it and can tell us a lot more than I could really. Are there special ways to handle, say, I mean, you could, that's, that's, um, sounds fine to do if you find like a piece of stone or pottery. What about with bones? Do you have to handle them in a special way? I, I mean, it's very important to always be respectful with human bones because, you know, they were once people. Mm -hmm. um, and they can be quite fragile depending on the conditions. Uh, when I'm in the lab uh, at Reading, I'm always wearing rubber gloves and in a lab coat. And we have a special room where all the tables are covered in bubble wrap. So when you, um, when you find the bones, do they all, do you take them out of the ground? Do you ever leave them there? So we try to leave things in situ when we can, but usually the type of archeology span that goes on in London is rescue archeology. span So we're taking things out so the building can go up. Mm -hmm. Um, with human remains, if they're past a certain point in history, um, they get reburied in consecrated ground. Oh. Technically, everything gets reburied in consecrated ground, but how long you're allowed to keep it out varies depending on how modern it is. So the more modern something is, the quicker it gets reburied, basically. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting to know. Um, I have a question. Do excavations in other cities show similar 
archaeology finds cities like Manchester? Yeah, Manchester is really good if you're interested in the Industrial Revolution. Um, I have a friend who primarily works in Manchester, and I get very jealous sometimes of some of the stuff she sends me, um, photos she sends me. Uh, York is fabulous if you're interested in the Vikings. Um, Newcastle and Durham are really good if you're in the medieval period. Um, wow. Everywhere has history, even in America. You know, <laughs> everywhere you go will have history. You just need to know where to look. Yeah, and it's interesting that, that different places maybe were more popular at a particular time than other places. So that that's, you know, part of history too, right? Mm. Um, know anything more about Stonehenge? So Stonehenge is a very popular topic. It is not something I know a lot about. Um, I specialize in a, a period that's a bit later in an area that's a bit further south and east. Um, I would absolutely recommend if you visit Stonehenge, though, that you also go to the village of Avesbury, which also has a stone circle around it, and I think is actually more impressive than Stonehenge. Controversial opinion. <laughs> okay, well, it looks like we're um, out of time. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. I know it's kind of late in England right now, but we really appreciate your being here. Um, and uh, for everybody who's um, on Zoom, uh, this has been recorded, so let your friends know. Um, it'll be up on our website soon, um, and so you could watch it again. And um, there's a short survey uh, when you um, when we end the webinar, so we'd appreciate your comments and any suggestions for future programs. So, okay. Thank you so much, Ellen, for being with us, and good luck and, and uh, great finds on the next digs that you go on and all the best for your PhD. So thank, thank you for being here and thank everyone for joining us.